So we're going to talk about um, self-funding. I know that a few of, uh, of the employers in the room are already self-funded. So some of the slides in the beginning of the presentation may be review for you, but hopefully it will reaffirm the decision you either made a month ago, like Willamette Dental, who was here and just went self-funded, or years ago about why you went self-funded in the first place, um, and then really speaking to the groups that are fully insured in the audience who are considering that maybe for the first time or considering it seriously for 2015. Then we're gonna spend some time talking about cost control strategies that we think are key for 2015. For That should at least be a part of your discussion. We can't cover everything. Obviously, we have limited time. But just hopefully we'll give you a few nuggets to walk away with this morning um, that, that are valuable to you and that will be valuable to your upcoming renewal. I snuck a peek at the registration. So um, I also know that of the fully insured groups, I think everybody in here has at least 100 uh, covered subscribers. Um, so what that means is that even if you're fully insured, which we'll talk about, um, you're currently at risk for your claims. So you all have that in common, meaning that even if you're fully insured, you can't escape the claims activity of your own population. So um, that's a really good reason, I think, for all of you to think about, well, if I'm already at risk, I'm gonna pay the bill, right, now or later, it's probably uh, good to consider what the advantages of self-funding are. All right, so we're gonna just do a quick tutorial comparing what a fully insured plan looks like compared to a self-funded plan. So fully insured plans, um, I had a client who um, was fully insured for a long time. They uh, had just about 1,000 employees and they went self-funded about two years ago. And the way he described a fully insured plan, he said, well, the carrier sets the price of milk. And that is true, right? The insurance carrier sets that fixed, fully insured premium uh, that's based on your expected claims. So for any group over 100 lives, a portion of that premium is set based on your historical claims experience. And then the underwriter uses a formula to set your rates. Sometimes it's a percent, you know, you have 50% of that rate is based on your claims experience, 50% of it is based on their pooled block. The larger you are, the more credible your uh, own experience, the more influence your own experience has on your insured rate. Um, then the employer has the advantage of you, you know what that rate is going into your plan year. You pay that fixed rate each month based on your enrollment, regardless of your claims activity. So if you have a really bad year, that bad year doesn't hit you immediately, but you know it's gonna come around uh, once you get that renewal for the next year. The insurance carrier, assumes the risk of that um, of losses. So if it's a really bad year, basically they have those losses for that year, but they're probably gonna make up for it the next year. And then um, the act, uh, and we talked about how actual claims expenses are used to calculate your future fully insured premium rates. Self-funded plans, on the other hand, um, the plan sponsor, so the employer, is the one who retains some, not all, of the risk of the claims expense. All of that risk is capped with a stop loss, insurance protection. Um, so we're gonna talk more about stop loss. But instead of a fixed, fully insured premium that covers claims and fixed fees, a self-funded plan basically pays a small portion of your overall expenses, your administrative expenses, that pays the administrator or the carrier um, a, the, a fixed amount to answer the phone, to produce ID cards, to produce your summary plan description, to adjudicate claims, to manage your plan. That portion of your expense is relatively low. Um, you also pay a fixed expense for your stop loss premium. So you generally, uh, a self-funded plan will get uh, a bill from your stop loss carrier and a bill from your administrator for those kind of low monthly expenses. And then on a weekly basis, generally, you would get a separate bill for the actual claims that were adjudicated by your administrator. 
For smaller groups, you can choose to only pay your claims on a monthly basis if that weekly cycle is too much. And there's also products um, that are coming out specifically, but LifeWise and Cigna have pretty popular products that actually level the amount of claims funding or max the amount of claims funding that you would be responsible for on a monthly basis. The administrator options, you could either uh, contract with an insured carrier like United Healthcare, or Aetna, Cigna, Regents is very popular and they could be the administrator of your self-funded health plan. So to your members, it looks and feels just like an insured plan, or you can use a third-party administrator or TPA. Um, so there are many TPAs on the market, some good, some inexpensive. <laughs> so uh, you have TPA options where there are some good things about having, you know, not being with the mega, mega, uh, carrier to administrate your, administrate your plan. It gives you lots and lots of flexibility. Um, so you've got some additional choices when you're self-funded compared to when you're fully insured. And then your stop loss premium, you can either choose to purchase your stop loss premium through the carrier if you went that route. So for example, Regents, uh, they you know administer self-funded plans and they also sell stop loss. So you can really have a bundled package or you can purchase uh, administrative services and go outside and buy, buy your stop loss directly from a stop loss carrier. So let's talk a little bit about stop loss. So one of the, um, one of the scary things about going self-funded and one of the barriers to going self-funded is obviously the risk of large claims. That especially for a smaller company, maybe 150, 200 lives. Um, that when, if you incur a shock claim, right, or two or three shock claims, uh, that the exposure to those claims, when it's not spread over a really large population, can uh, really increase in, uh, your overall cost of the plan. And that financial exposure is scary. The good news is, is you can really limit the financial exposure to your plan and the liability to your plan by purchasing two types of insurance. Um, individual, so specific stop loss, uh, that caps any indivi one individual, singular individual's claims, your liability for their claim, at a specific threshold. You choose that what's called deductible for the full plan year. And you could buy a deductible, let's say you bought a $50,000 ISL, individual stop loss uh, policy. It means for that individual, uh, you would be liable for $50,000 with their claims for that person. And the insurance, uh, the stop loss policy would cover their claims in excess of $50,000 for the rest of the plan year. Um, so that, you know, for those scary, million dollar claims, which don't happen very often, more likely you're going to have a $100,000 claim or $150,000 claim. But if you have three of those, it can still have a pretty big impact on your overall costs. So limiting that exposure really protects your plan. The other type of stop loss is called aggregate stop loss. And aggregate stop loss limits your liability to the group as a whole. So it basically says if we expect the insurance company, the underwriter, expects your claims expense to be a million dollars for the year, then they say, okay, if you wanna buy aggregate stop loss, you purchase aggregate stop loss generally at 125% of that expected limit. So in this case, they would say, okay, you're on the hook, right, for everything up to 1.25 million. After that, you're insured. So you know that in a worst case scenario year, you know what your maximum exposure is. So those two protections together, you really can lever up or lever down what you want, what your, uh, depending on what your risk tolerance is, what you uh, and your CFO decide to set in terms of your liability. So here's just an example of um, how an individual stop loss uh, claim would work. So in this case, the ISL level is that $50,000. Let's say an individual um, had $75,000 worth of claims paid. So the employer again pays the first 50,000 and the reinsurer or stop loss carrier is responsible 
for the 25,000. To the provider, hospital system generally, of course the full claim is paid up to the allowable amount. Um, so we're, let's see, aggregate stop loss, we talked about how this works. So we'll just give you an example again. This is an illustration of what I just walked through in terms of how you set your aggregate stop loss level. This is uh, not something that is set by the partners group. It's an insured product. So the underwriter, whoever your stop loss carrier is, is basically calculating what they expect your claims to be in a given year. And then you buy aggregate stop loss as a percentage. So you can buy it at generally either 120 or 125 percent of that expected claims level. So what we do is uh, we'll negotiate with your stop loss carrier if we think their expected claims rate is too high. So Amber in the back of the room, raise your hand. Uh, she is on our data analytics team um, and is one of our underwriters. And so what we do for our clients is we'll project what we think your expected claims pick will be. We compare that against the stop loss carrier just to make sure that they aren't arbitrarily have, haven't had a really high expected rate and then your 125% protection is really 50% over your true expected claims. So that's where we get involved in negotiating what that expected rate uh, should be. The good news is very, very rarely does a group ever get close to their aggregate stop loss limit. And that's because uh, for the most part, claims on a, as for the group as a whole is very predictable. The stop, uh, the individual stop loss or the shock claims, those are the claims that are hard to predict. But overall, on the group basis, aggregate stop loss is pretty. Uh, it would be pretty unusual to have a year where you went more than 25% in excess of expected claims. So that makes aggregate stop loss pretty inexpensive. That is usually in the single, you know, it's less than $10 per employee per month, where your specific stop loss, because those claims are more frequent, and because the exposure to the carrier could be hundreds of thousands of dollars on a single claim, that type of coverage um, can be closer to $100 per employee per month, because the claims frequency is higher and the claim severity is higher. But aggregate stop loss, it's very rare that we would have an actual claim on aggregate. And so some groups choose to go without aggregate stop loss, that they choose only to purchase specific stop loss and don't, uh, don't buy aggregate stop loss protection. The larger you are, the more predictable your claims are. So the more you, should, you would be, feel comfortable, kind of, we call it going bare uh, without aggregate stop loss. But uh, we don't have any groups that don't, um, I think, have at least a specific. Even our largest groups have some level of specific stop loss protection, okay? All right, so here's one more uh, visual of how the uh, individual and aggregate stop loss work together. So just a quick note on this slide uh, is that Anything, in this case, the aggregate or the stop loss deductible is 200,000 and it's a $300,000 claim. In this case, the uh, $100,000 of the claim was paid by the stop loss carrier. It's important to remember that anything in excess of your deductible that's reimbursed by the stop loss carrier does not accumulate towards your aggregate uh, stop loss. So it's only claims that you pay as the plan sponsor that are gonna aggregate towards that 125% of expected claims. So because large claims over your deductible are kind of thrown out, because that's not an expense of yours, that's another reason with that we very rarely see an, a claim on an aggregate stop loss. So let's talk about um, the advantages. Uh, I should have a big dollar sign on this slide because that's really what it's about, right? It's about, there are, some, um, there are some plan design advantages, certainly, but the big motivator for HR teams and for finance teams about considering going self-funding self uh, route is this financial savings. So the first bullet here is retention. Retention uh, technically is a word that carriers use uh, to set their administrative fees. So even if you're fully insured, right, they have to pay their light bill, pay for customer service, adjudicate claims, all of those services besides just the risk of the claims. 
but in ret the retention in a fully insured plan is much more expensive than the administrative fees charged on a self-funded plan. This is where profit is built in. Um, and you can, if you line up, if you are fully insured versus self-funded, same carrier, right? So let's say you went with the ASO model where it's a fully insured carrier and you're just moving to a self-funded chassis, you would see significant savings, fixed fee savings, uh, by comparing all the line items on retention. Uh, the health insurance premium fee. This is a new financial advantage, uh, and that is that under ACA, there's a new tax that only applies to fully insured plans. That tax, it ranges between two and 3% of your total premium. So even in yesterday's world, where there was a financial reason to consider self-funding, that financial reason just got even more important in 2014 and beyond because of this new health insurance premium fee charged uh, to all fully insured plans. Margin, so this is a, what's a risk charge, right? The insurance carrier on a fully insured plan, uh, they are taking the risk on your plan, so they're gonna charge you for that. Um, and the cost for them taking the risk is generally about 3%. So that's also a charge that you would avoid being self-funded. Cash flow. So cash flow, you know, if you're fully insured, you're paying a fixed monthly premium to the fully insured carrier, regardless of where your claims uh, end up. And you, one of the disadvantages to self-funded, uh, a self-funded contract, is the volatility of claims month to month. The advantage to the volatility of claims month to month is that you get to keep the money in your own bank account, right? You're holding all your reserves. That money stays within your organization. It stays until you actually need it to pay those claims. You have control over that money. And at some point when we start making interest <laughs> again, <laughs> you'll be able to earn some money or earn some interest on that money. So additional cash flow is also a good advantage of being self-funded. So here's just a quick slide that basically illustrates the percentage savings between uh, a fully insured plan and a self-funded plan. So in general, and a conservative, I think, uh, projection before ACA was that comparing a fully insured plan and a self-funded plan, um, assuming that our claims projection was the same as the fully insured carrier, it was about a 5% savings in administrative fees. So using uh, the carrier trends are a bit higher on fully insured plans. Uh, premium, uh, premium tax, and then low, lower retention was about a 5% differential. In addition to that, now we have this additional 3% charge that is assessed to fully insured plans. So in general, uh, on a conservative basis, the total advantage of going self-funded is about 8% of total, your total spend, which um, can be a big number, right? 8% um, year over year. Um, is a significant savings to both the plan sponsor and of course your employees who share in the cost of their plan. So let's talk about the downside of self-funded, uh, being self-funded. So one, you're at risk, right? Some years, you're not gonna win. It is not a win at every single plan year to be self-funded. Over the long term, so you really have to look at being self-funded with a long-term strategy. Over the long term, being self-funded, if you're a large enough group, is the most efficient way and lowest cost vehicle to fund your health plan, but that's no guarantee that it's gonna be lower cost in any given year. So you have to be able financially as an organization uh, to have the cash flow in order to sustain those bad years. Um, and just a rule of thumb, you know, one out of every four years is gonna be a tough year, right? The three other years are gonna make up for that. Uh, but you do have that volatility and you are at risk, limited, of course, to your stop loss protection. Asset exposure and fiduciary responsibility. If you go self-funded, and for all you self-funded groups, it's a reminder, right? You are the fiduciary, right? We can't assign that legally to anybody else. If you're self-funded, the, if the plan was sued, right? The plan sponsor is the one named in that suit. We can assign fiduciary 
uh, responsibility to our plan administrators so they can be the ones to administer our appeals process. They can be the ones to adjudicate our claims. They can be the ones making all the plan determinations. But at the end of the day, on a self-funded plan, you are the plan sponsor and you are the fiduciary of that plan. So uh, that means some additional responsibility. It's, it means working with your broker to make sure that we're uh, selecting a strong third-party administrator or carrier who's going to um, make sure that they're administering the plan in a compliant way, um, that we're following ERISA because under a, a self-funded plan, you're no longer subject to state mandates. You're governed by uh, the federal law, ERISA, making sure that you know we're administering, of course, COBRA. You know, you're still responsible for that, administering it correctly on a fully insured plan. Uh, so there are some additional levels of scrutiny and um, kind of management and oversight that the uh, that HR team would be responsible for, along with your broker and uh, TPG partner. Uh, but this is an important one to make sure that it doesn't get skirted over because. Uh, as a self-funded plan, there are some fiduciary responsibilities that you as a plan sponsor would be responsible for. Here's a quick comparison of monthly expenses. So this goes to the volatility of your expenses on a monthly basis. So the red line on this graph, this basically is illustrating the first year expenses of a self-funded health plan. So, uh, Wendy, I hope you don't mind, uh, but Wendy is here. She's a client of the partners group who just moved self-funded effective May 1st. So Wendy is in that second dot <laughs> of her first plan year as, on, as a self-funded plan. We can expect that as Willamette Dental Group goes through their plan year, they're gonna have volatility month to month in their claims expense. Okay? And that's one of those downsides of being self-funded, especially in the first year, getting used to that, oh my gosh, you know, it was a $40,000 claims poll. Oh, now it's a $90,000 claims poll. Oh, it was a good one, it was only 30,000. Getting used to that and letting that go and saying, I can't obsess about every claims poll or it's gonna make me crazy, right? It takes about a year to get over that kind of anticipation of running to accounting and figure, you know opening up the <sighs> right and uh, because it's you're not used to that you're used to paying a fixed monthly bill the comparison is that that teal bar so the very top bar that is compared against your fully insured premium and then the blue line below that that is uh, basically your self-funded budget rate that's what we we would recommend budgeting on a monthly basis so you can see that the, the trade-off for that volatility of monthly expenses is if you don't wanna go there, you know that you are accepting a higher, although fixed and predictable rate, it is higher than what it would otherwise be. What's interesting is that when you compare the monthly volatility of claims expense of a, a self-funded plan, Actually, um, on, a self, or on a fully insured basis, you see that same uh, volatility, but it's on an annual basis. So this was a group, not Willamette Dental Group, a different group that moved self-funded about two years ago. And this was a, a six-year retrospective review. Uh, this was a group that really wanted to make sure that they knew, right, self-funding was a good and finan financially wise decision for them. So what we did, as we said, okay, we're gonna put our what if hat on and do a backwards calculation and look at the last six years and say, would we have won or lost each year had we been self-funded in each of the past six years? And this is what it looked like. The yellow line was their actual fully insured premium for each year. The blue line was their adjusted claims each year. The red line was their self-funded cost estimate, so claims plus fixed fee. So it's actually, you can see on, based on the red line, that is a smoother increase year over year than what the costs actually were uh, because on a fully insured basis, they're always playing catch up, right? To the last two years of claim. Last two years of claims were good. We have a low year, right? Oh, oh, our claims went up. Now we have to overcorrect. So you see this volatility in the fully insured uh, premium that we're always kind of chasing and negotiating that premium dollar. 
and the red line, when you smooth it out and look at a longer term basis, it's actually more consistent in terms of year over year expenses. The other learning from this was again, you don't win every year, right? You can see that in two out of the six years, the yellow line was lower than the red line. Uh, but that in the rest of the four out of the six years, there was significant savings. And so averaged out over a longer time period, if the group took a long-term look at self-funding, um, it became clear that that was the, the better uh, funding vehicle for them. Here's an example, some uh, uh, analysis we go through with all of our clients uh, when they're considering self-funding. And basically, it's claim scenario. So we call it the rainbow chart. And uh, it is, some of you in the room have seen the rainbow chart. Um, and what it's basically showing, that middle unshaded column called expected, that is comparing if, you, if your claims come in exactly where they, we predict them to come in, which is unrealistic. It, you know, we think we're doing good if we get between a minus five and a plus five, right? That's about the range of what we would expect you to actually come in at. But it shows you the win-loss scenario. So what if our claims came in better than 15% better than we expected? In this case, for this client, it would be a $1.8 million win. Well, what if on the other end of the spectrum, what if we hit our maximum claims liability? What does that look like? What do I need to tell my CFO to say, okay, we're gonna do this, but in a worst case scenario, here's what it would cost us. That, in this case, it would be a $746,000 additional cost. The likely scenario is somewhere in the middle, the better than 5% to worse than 5% which in this case was a win of uh, a little bit over 1 million to a win of about 350,000. So in that window of most likely scenarios, um, and if we were right in the middle, you can see that this client would save 8% going self-funded. So um, this is the type of analysis that if you were considering and uh, going self-funded, this is what we would walk you through. And again, Every, you know, there, it, moving self-funded is all about timing. <laughs> so if you're coming, it, this worksheet won't always show a win. If the carrier is really aggressive and that fully insured premium is significantly lower than, is what, than what is necessary to really cover your claims, you might put off moving self-funded a year. Take advantage of that low kind of gimme rate, right? And look at it again the next year. So this type of analysis, this win-loss um, scenario, this is really important. And it isn't always going to point towards self-funding, but it is uh, worth the conversation. Just quickly, um, another barrier to some groups considering going self-funded is, gosh, that sounds like a lot of work. I am only one person, right? Or I have a, a lean HR team and we are already stretched to the max. And it feels like going self-funded is one more thing for our team to have to manage and work through and try and figure out. Um, it, there is a transition. It does take your resources to kind of move through that transition to go from fully insured to self-funded. Um, and you're involving some additional team members. So accounting is involved in this transition because they have to be the ones to now adjust to the new billing process, right? They aren't just, you aren't just signing a premium bill, sending it to accounting, they pay it. Um, they're the ones who are gonna be involved in that ACH uh, claims pro weekly claims process. Uh, but it isn't, it isn't too bad, right? So um, again, I think for the handful of people who raise their hands that are already self-funded, once you get used to that process, it just becomes an, another normal process. I haven't heard of anybody who's had to hire a new team member to, um, to adjust to the additional workload of going self-funded. So um, this is uh, just a quick overview of how the process of that accounting and billing, that billing process works. So mainly that weekly claims process is an ACH process. So you identify somebody in your accounting department who's going to be notified when that claims pull is ready to fund. And then within 24 to 48 hours, your accounting team either pushes or authorizes a withdrawal from an account to pay those claims, okay? 
One last piece on uh, self-funding, and then we're gonna move on to some other strategies, is this whole notion of IBNR, IBNR, incurred but not reported. Um, this is a requirement under uh, a self-funded health plan that you need to book some reserves. And those reserves, we calculate them for you, we, Amber. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I like to just hook myself onto the Amber train and say we. Um, Amber and Adam in Cases Department, they do an excellent job of releasing a formal incur but not reported uh, letter to our clients that helps you at the end of your plan year uh, determine what is the appropriate amount of reserves that I need to book. And the purpose of this is to say, you know, as a self-funded plan, you are responsible for any claims that are incurred during the current uh, plan year. But you may not see the bill for those for three to six months. So you need to book that as a liability in your plan year, your fiscal year, to say we're reserving $200,000 to pay claims that have been incurred and are our responsibility, but just haven't been paid yet. And that reserve gets adjusted every year. And in the event that you decided at some point that you need to move back to a fully insured plan or terminate your self-funded plan for some reason, that reserve becomes the bank that you pay your runout claims with, okay? Uh, because that's what, it's, that's what it's really for.